Um, I am Dr. Dina Zuvala, and this is the second seminar in a new seminar series I'm running under the auspices of the Center um, of International uh, and Public Law Civil. And the title of the seminar series is The Politics of International Law. And the idea is, as you will see today, to bring in conversations, um, in conversation people who are working uh, on cutting edge and interdisciplinary issues um, on international law and bring them in conversation from colleagues from the ANU. Uh, in this case, actually, um, one of our colleagues who is not based in the College, uh, college of Law to discuss international law, both, of course, um, its doctrinal perspectives, but also much broadly um, its, its political implications in the world. And today, uh, well, actually, before I get started, I would like to acknowledge that today I'm zooming in um, from Sydney, that is the unceded country of the Gadigal people of the Euro nation. And I know also many more of you are uh, zooming in from unceded um, indigenous country. And I would like to pay my respect to um, elders past, present and emerging as well as to any indigenous um, Australians that might be joining us uh, online today. Um, so today I'm really excited um, to be welcoming professors Lucas, Lucas Lysinski and Laura Jane Smith. Um, Lucas will be our speaker for today and Laura Jane is going to be uh, um, his commentator. Um, Professor Smith is, uh, is actually a colleague of ours at the ANU. She's based, um, she's the head of the Center for Heritage and Museum Studies. Um, and her work um, is particularly prescient, I think, for lawyers because she's treating cultural heritage not simply as objects or as signs, but as cultural processes um, that create meaning and create memory. And I think we can see here how that could be of a special interest uh, to lawyers. She's um, a leading figure in critical cultural studies and she was also, she's also the founding chair of the Association of Critical Heritage Studies and she's the editor of the International Journal of Cultural Studies and she's also um, the co-editor of um, a series on key issues of cultural studies with Routledge and she will co be commenting on the work of Professor Lukas Lesinski um, who is based at UNSW. Lucas, um, is a leading authority on cultural heritage in international law, especially um, the question of UNESCO. But he also has a very impressive record on international human rights law, the UN and questions of international law and slash in Latin America. Um, when I say he's a leading authority, I actually mean it. And it's not just me. If you don't believe me, you should believe Azel. Um, because the American Society of International Law awarded um, late last year um, to Lucas and his co-editor the Certificate of Merit um, for his co-edited volume, uh, UNESCO's Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention. Um, Lucas is also the, edit the author of three monographs um, in international law, and actually his, his the forthcoming one, which is forthcoming probably as you heard within the next few weeks, is entitled Legalized Identities, Cultural Heritage and the Shaping of Transitional Justice. And it is actually about this monograph um, that Lucas will be talking about. Uh, for those of you who haven't joined um, the seminar series before, the idea is that our presenter, Lucas, in this instance, will be talking roughly for I don't know, anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes to be followed by comments and in discussion with our discussant, Professor Smith. And after that, we will be opening the floor for discussions. We anticipate we might run a bit over the hour, so we, we might go uh, up to, you know, 10, 15 past. And of course, people should feel free to, you know, leave whenever they have to um, if they're teaching and whatnot. And on that note, I'm going to pass the floor and the microphone to Lucas, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing about this book. Thank you, Dina. Uh, thank you, Laura Jane, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm also speaking from uh, the unceded territory of the Gadigal people of the Yara Nation, um, and it's an honor to uh, 
be talking to you all uh, about this project, which I've had a lot of fun um, doing. Um, now, let me do this zoomy thingy. And right. So the title of the monograph is, is the title of today, right? And what did I mention? Legalized identities, cultural heritage law, and the shaping of transitional justice. Um, and um, what I want to talk about today is essentially this idea of connecting to different fields of the law, right? Transitional justice, or which is a broader interdisciplinary field as is cultural heritage. Um, but doing the, the law side of both of those fields um, and connecting them through the idea of pragmatism. So the, the, those two fields, traditional justice and cultural heritage law, they share a number of characteristics. Um, they're both very expert driven, very legalistic in a lot of their readings. Um, and they, ha they have a purported neutrality to them. Um, and they also tend to look at the past uh, but in the present, we have a view of shaping the future, right? Um, and that's one of my little pet peeves as a flate to say that uh, um, particularly Captain Cook statues uh, in Australia somehow represent history and should be left untouched. Well, they're not history, right? The, 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 they're at most heritage and, uh, and heritage is the, the objective of heritage is not history, right? History is the instrument of heritage, right? So it's a very different relationship. Um, so it's we're not trying to sanctify, or we should not be trying to sanctify a past. We're rather using it in the past to project something onto the future. Um, and, and then the my main goal in, in this respect with this project is to kind of unsettle this discourse of anti-impunity uh, that shapes so much of our traditional justice responses in international law, and also to frame heritage as um, a bounded and authorized uh, discourse, uh, at least more than people assume it to be, right? And in this respect, I'm going to be using slightly different terminology, uh, but I rely very much on Laura Jane's uh, big idea of the authorized heritage discourse, which is this idea that we have all these practices around heritage that are um, bounded and authorized and the law being actually a main authorizer of what heritage is and what it can be used for and what it can be mean. So given this context, my thesis for you today um, is that although both these fields of transitional justice and cultural heritage law share uh, this impulse towards technique and a principled or abstract type of decision-making, um, the encounter of these two actually makes a lot of room for uh, pragmatism or for a more nuanced uh, interaction uh, between um, yeah those ideas and and, um, and the, the 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 messy reality on the ground. Now, uh, before I actually get into talking a lot about this conversation, I just want to quickly to those of you who are not that familiar with cultural heritage. Uh, and cultural heritage law in particular, to talk a little bit about how it is structured. Um, and uh, international heritage law is structured around domains of heritage. That's the terminology that UNESCO uses. Um, one of them uh, that uh, almost everyone would be familiar with is that of cultural objects. Um, and of course, I could not uh, choose anything other than the Parthenon marbles uh, to illustrate uh, cultural objects as a domain of heritage. Um, another major domain is that of underwater heritage, which we will focus on uh, in a lot more detail today alongside cultural objects. Um, and, you know, underwater heritage, fairly intuitive. It is the things that are under the water. We tend to think of shipwrecks and, um, you know, pirate ships uh, and the things contained in those pirate ships. So it's both the wreck themselves and the objects, uh, but it also extends to a whole range of other uh, much more recent uh, types of formations, um, such as, uh, importantly for today, um, World War I um, ships and aircraft uh, and all sorts of other things, um, as long as they are not currently in use, right? Um, another domain that is relevant in the area of transitional justice is that of cultural heritage in wartime. That's actually where UNESCO started um, regulating cultural heritage via international law, right? Um, and we're talking about, yeah, things that get destroyed like um, in this case, uh, the Aleppo souk uh, that was uh, destroyed in the, um, during the still ongoing Syrian conflict. Now, um, another major domain, and that's probably where UNESCO is at its best known in the area of cultural heritage is world heritage, right? So the World Heritage Convention has 
196 states parties last time I checked. Um, and um, and the, one of its big things is that it creates the World Heritage List, which contains 1,121 properties across 170 countries around the world. Um, and those can be both natural and cultural um, and also a, a new mixed category, a relatively new mixed category of cultural landscapes, uh, which is where the Uluru, for instance, sits. And it's this idea of nature modified in some way by human presence. Um, and then, of course, uh, another domain, which is the more recent UNESCO treaty, uh, is that of intangible cultural heritage, um, which is a treaty to which Australia is not a party, uh, but that's a very different conversation. Uh, but intangible heritage is UNESCO speak for what popularly we would know it as folklore, but UNESCO has shifted away from that terminology for a number of reasons that are not super pertinent for today. Um, and then there's a bunch of emerging areas or emerging domains of cultural heritage, uh, which is areas that UNESCO is considering regulating um, via treaties, which is things like archives, languages, and uh, landscapes. Um, they all appear as part of existing domains, uh, but UNESCO is always pondering whether they should develop a specific treaty uh, for languages or a specific treaty for landscapes and so on and so forth. Now, um, connecting all of these domains of heritage uh, via the UNESCO standard setting action, which is the terminology again that they use for you know, them writing treaties about it, um, is this idea of the conservation paradigm, which is a play again on Lord Jane's authorized heritage discourse, uh, but kind of bringing it more uh, to a law uh, kind of take. Um, and it's this idea that international heritage law is grounded very much on the preservation and protection of heritage. Um, so it is very hard for uh, the law to think of heritage as anything other than that, what than something that needs to be preserved and protected, right? Uh, so once something is declared by the law as heritage, then that's kind of it. It's going to be there forever, um, and um, and it's never going to. It's not to be touched or renegotiated or revisited in any way. Uh, that's kind of the baseline assumption of the conservation paradigm. So it's not only about the actual physical thing, um, it's also the narrative around it, right? It's, it's um, uh, the conservation paradigm does not invite a renegotiation of the story we tell about that heritage and why that heritage matter and what that heritage symbolizes. Um, and again, because heritage is not history, right? It's a, it's a past that we choose in the present to say something about the future. The fact that we can never challenge that past uh, in the eyes of the law, uh, becomes very problematic um, from um, a reality perspective, I suppose, uh, and also, of course, from the perspective of shifting priorities, um, as uh, it happens a lot in transitioning societies. Um, now, and, and that kind of begs the question of whether heritage can be legitimately destroyed, um, and if you ask international law, international law is going to say no. Um, heritage of a certain importance uh, can never be destroyed. And it was a reaction to the Bamiyan Buddhas in 2001, uh, in, them being bombed by the Taliban regime. Um, and and um, it had already been the reaction before then, but that, that moment really crystallized this idea that no matter what happens, we should not be destroying heritage. And that's a very clear expression or a, a very powerful expression of a conservation paradigm. That said, uh, that, that there's more and more pressure for this conservation paradigm to be subject to the sentiment of communities that live in with or around heritage. Um, now, international law has a very hard time coming to terms with that sentiment um, because of its, well, the way it is structured, right? And we're talking about treaties uh, adopted in the 50s and 70s for the most part. Um, it's only the Intangible Heritage Convention and the Underwater, Underwater Heritage Convention that are on this side of the millennium, right? Uh, so we're talking about a very antiquated or um, passé, I suppose, uh, understanding of how heritage is used. Um, but because international law is notoriously difficult to reform, uh, we tend to kind of keep reinforcing uh, those assumptions in the practice of heritage as well. Um, now, uh, and, and again, and then I just wanted to call, draw attention to the quote at the bottom of the slide, which is from the American Historical Association, uh, which says that to remove a monument, and then they're thinking about the Confederate monuments in the US, 
um, is not to erase history, but rather to alter or call attention to previous interpretation of history. So again, this idea that um, despite the conservation paradigm, uh, having this assumption, this static assumption about what, his, what heritage is and what it's used for, uh, even historians have started to disagree with that. Um, and I like the, the Confederate Monuments story about it, even though I'm not talking too much about it, uh, about the details of it today. Um, I like because it, it, it's kind of a current example of people actually actively calling for heritage to be removed, right? Or, or heritage to be uh, taken out of sight or changed in any kind of meaningful way. Um, and uh, some of that, um, of course, is that the connection to transitional justice, right? Not only uh, race and Black Lives Matter in the US, but even in Australia, echoes of Black Lives Matter have also, uh, through indigenous peoples, right? Have also gone in this direction of removing monuments, such as, um, for instance, the Captain Cook statue uh, that you see at the bottom of the slide, which was not removed, uh, but it was um, redecorated with some uh, nice graffiti. Uh, and the people who did that, uh, both women were prosecuted uh, as a result. Um, but anyway, uh, back to transitional justice more generally, just to contextualize it, um, TJ, as I'm gonna refer to it, is a set of legal, political, and social measures uh, that are aimed at helping a society overcome a past of oppression or conflict and to establish or reestablish the rule of law. That's kind of the basic UN kind of definition of it, um, which is of course problematic in so many different ways, uh, but let's just run with it for the purposes of today. Uh, but we can talk a about it a little bit more uh, in Q&A if people are interested. Now, the main mechanisms through which um, societies transition, right, from this difficult past are those of accountability and justice, um, in the first place, truth uh, in the second place, then reparations and then guarantees of non-repetition. Um, reparations and guarantees of non-repetition are fairly closely interconnected, um, except that reparations is about redressing the past and guarantees of non-repetition is creating safeguards to make sure that whatever happened in the past doesn't happen in the future again, right? Um, so one is a bit more backwards looking, the other more, is a bit more forwards looking, uh, but they're usually um, in the same kind of uh, basket as it were. Um, and things like the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which is the other image on the slide, um, are very much transitional justice um, or have a transitional justice element to them, um, and specifically uh, the call for truth in the Uluru Statement, right? Uh, voice, treaty, truth, that's what the Uluru Statement is all about, and truth is essentially a mechanism of transitional justice. Um, now, the, um, further uh, to take into account when we talk about transitional justice is the temporal limitations of it. Uh, we're usually referring to situations that happened in the recent past, such as the civil war or dictatorship, but increasingly, we're also looking at things with a much more distant uh, kind of connection, uh, such as the impact of colonialism on indigenous peoples. And it has happened with some success in Canada. And that has driven a lot of the calls in Australia as well. Right, so now that we have a sense of what cultural heritage stands for and the conservation paradigm underpinning it, and also transitional justice, um, I wanna talk about two specific case studies of how these things play out. First of all, I wanna talk about atrocity museums, uh, and then we will talk a little bit about underwater heritage and specifically Anzac corpses uh, in, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, but first on atrocity museums, um, th there's a lot to be said about how museums relate to transitional justice, right? Um, and it's, uh, a lot of it has to do with this idea of the evolution of museums. Uh, they stopped just being um, the repositories of empire in the case of the museums like the British Museum or repositories of the, the finest achievements of human civilization, um, as it were. Um, and they have uh, embarked on much more proactive communicative functions and, and projecting, again, projecting a lot more the future rather than just the past, right? Um, and, um, and human rights museums in particular are a great example of that, uh, how that plays out. Um, and uh, there are great museums around the world which are actually founded on this idea of helping a society overcome a difficult past and pronounce a, a commitment to human rights, right? Um, so international heritage law tends to treat museums as rather passive. It focuses more on the objects than the institution that holds them. Um, 
but increasingly international heritage law has also paid more and more attention to museums themselves again taking into account this uh, bigger communicative kind of role of museums um, and museums help narrate the past uh, but then there's also a lot of uh, tensions uh, that come up in the way that museums have engaged with transitional justice such as uh, this idea of victimization um, which is a big question in transitional justice more generally, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and, and the victimization comes from locating the causes of atrocity uh, externally, right, outside of the country where the museum happens to sit. And that's something that cultural heritage law, and it's a big theme in the whole book, has facilitated uh, in many ways. Instead of facilitating um, the, the cross-cultural dialogue that the UNESCO Constitution promises is key to peace, um, international heritage law has rather operated so that people can select narratives of victimhood um, that makes states look better uh, and look like victims um, as opposed to perpetrators of atrocity and that creates a very one-sided kind of conversation about transition um, and, and, and in making these enemies of course uh, these external enemies uh, there's a lot of a lot of authoring going on um, and that makes one query uh, this role of museums as containers or tellers of truth, right? We tend to think of museums much like we think of libraries. It's where, you know, the, we're, we're going to find out the truth about the life and the universe. Um, and, uh, well, turns out that not so much, at least in their relationship with transitional justice. Um, as you can see here, this is the definition of cultural objects in international law. Um, and you can see what international law considers to be heritage, uh, the heritage that fits inside a museum, essentially, right? Um, and we're talking about items of fauna, flora, um, objects of uh, artistic interest, ethnological interest, and we're going to go back to ethnology in a minute when we talk about corpses, uh, so keep that in mind. But also we're talking about archives, right? And that's where um, transitional justice is probably at its best. Uh, in its interaction with museums, it's when it holds the archives of transition themselves, which is what happens, for instance, in the Human Rights Museum in Chile. But instead of talking about Chile, I want to talk about South Korea. Now, South Korea, uh, in Seoul, there's this museum called the Sudamun Prison, um, which is a, uh, a way, uh, or a great institution in many ways, but it also tends to promote what I, I'm calling for the purpose of today, two-tiered transition. Right, so it's a museum that um, commemorates or um, discusses, I suppose, narrates uh, the memory of Japanese occupation uh, in uh, the Korean Peninsula, which was from 1910 to 1945. Um, and th there's a lot of conversation about it being part of a future World Heritage Site, uh, which is provisionally called the Japanese Second World War Prison Sites. Um, and it's going to be, and it's a joint effort between China and uh, South Korea, uh, know that Japan is not really included in this conversation. Um, and part of that is actually a reaction to the, the or, or it's a product of the narrative of victimization, right? Or the impulse towards victimization. Because um, Japan was very criticized when it included Hiroshima um, in, on the World Heritage List, um, criticized particularly by China, uh, by saying, look, Hiroshima uh, narrates the Japanese as victims of the war rather than perpetrators. Um, and uh, so in response, uh, we're going to show uh, the world all the awful things that they did out there. That's so, right. And Sodomon Prison does uh, or attempts to do that. Um, and it has this focus on truth and also this idea of guarantees of non-repetition, right? We should never allow ourselves to be oppressed in this way. We should never oppress our fellow Koreans in this way. Um, but it is very much a narrative of uh, victimhood, as I already mentioned, um, and a little bit of triumphalism, right? This idea of how we overcame Japanese occupation um, and we're, 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 we're better and we're stronger and we're united kind of thing, right? Um, that's kind of the narration to uh, both a Korean and a world audience. Uh, but there's also an important difference when we talk about the Korean audiences here. Um, there's an entire building in the complex, which is then, you know, so it's a building, that, a wing of the museum, as it were, um, which is about dictator, Korean dictatorship in South Korea, 
after the end of Japanese occupation, so in the immediate aftermath of World War II, um, which sounds great, right? Korean, uh, the Korean cultural institution coming to terms with that difficult moment in Korean history, except that that entire wing is only in Korean. Um, so it, it doesn't, it, so which is this idea that we narrate our own perpetratorship, as it were, only to ourselves, onto the world, and we're going to use international law to facilitate that. Uh, we're only going to narrate our own victimhood. And that's the trend in almost all heritage uh, uh, that connects with UNESCO, um, with the, a few exceptions in South Africa. Uh, but for the most part, we're narrating victimhood and we're hiding away uh, our um, perpetratorship, right? Even if you look at concentration camps, none of the German concentration camps, which are kept on German heritage uh, lists, are actually um, listed before UNESCO, right? Um, the only one that is listed is the one that happens to be in Poland, uh, which was a narration of Polish victimhood when it was actually added to the World Heritage List. Anyway, sorry, uh, I'm getting sidetracked. Back to this. Um, so there's a lot of selectivity and contestation that is enabled through legal protection, right? Well, international law in particular allows um, states to select specific narrations uh, and, and they go largely uncontested uh, in no small part because again, the state is the only one who gets to propose, the territorial state is the only one who gets to propose heritage for inclusion on a UNESCO list. Uh, and therefore they get to choose not only what heritage, but also the nar narrative around that heritage. And there's very, there are very few opportunities for contestation, uh, which are very, uh, even more uh, sporadically used. Now, so that's kind of the, the, the gist with atrocity museums. And the next big thing I wanted to talk about was this idea of corpses and cultural heritage uh, in the connection to transitional justice. Um, and I want to talk specifically about Anzac corpses, uh, because we are, after all, in Australia, um, and we all love the Anzac, um, even if we don't think about them quite in this fashion that often. Um, now, th th there's a lot of um, legal imaginaries of underwater heritage out there, right? So when the UNESCO, when the Underwater Heritage Convention was drafted in 2001, um, they were mostly thinking about the Titanic, right? Um, and what the Titanic contained, because it, they had found it and, and had the technology to get to the wreck just as the convention was being drafted. So it was very much in everyone's minds. Uh, and it was this idea of, um, you know, protecting uh, the, the, the sacred, as it were, uh, heritage that happens to be underwater. Um, when the convention was adopted in 2001, the Australian government rejected it um, and said, no, we, we don't really care about this. We want to protect uh, our common law based salvage regime, which allows us to not protect these things on site, but rather to bring them to the surface um, and either exploit them commercially or put them in museums like um, the, the one in, in uh, not in Perth, in Fremantle, uh, the Australian National Maritime Museum that contains the, the wreck of the Batavia, right? And everything that was uh, in that ship, which is a fantastic museum, by the way, strongly recommend it. Uh, but anyway, right, so the, it was not so much uh, let's preserve it on site because it's sacred, it's let's bring it to the surface. That was the position of the Australian government until uh, 2018 um, when uh, Australia adopted a new act uh, or that replaced the previous um, Underwater Heritage Act, which is now the Underwater Cultural Heritage Act of 2018. Um, and very clearly they indicate uh, in, the, in the second reading speech and all the conversation around that act, that it is a prelude to the ratification of the Underwater Cultural Heritage. What changed? Well, under the Underwater Cultural Heritage Convention, um, uh, if you look at the definition on the slide, uh, we're talking about things that have been underwater for at least 100 years. Um, so most things in the history of Australia as a settled society um, and separate from, well, separate uh, from the United Kingdom, right? Having its own constitution. Um, much of it didn't really fall in, uh, in the, that 100 year gap. Uh, but then uh, come 2018, things that are fairly significant to the way that Australia narrates itself and its national identity all of a sudden get included. And we're talking about World War I wrecks 
uh, and um, both shipwrecks and aircraft and everything that was in those vessels. So there's a renewed interest and a lot of um, veterans associations uh, groups really lobbied the government hard on this for the adoption of this legislation uh, because they wanted to include those things such uh, included in the, in the underwater heritage convention such as sites structures buildings artifacts and importantly human remains um, now human remains is a big innovation in many ways apologies in international cultural heritage law because up until the underwater cultural heritage convention the only reference and it was still a very indirect reference to human remains was in the 1970 convention when it talked about artifacts of ethnological interest so all of a sudden we go from um, objects of ethnological interest being possibly cultural heritage now we have human remains in ships very spelled out as being underwater heritage and uh, in this respect Importantly as well, the convention says that the parties shall ensure that proper respect is given to all human remains and they should not be disturbed, um, which is a very different position from that of uh, remains simply an object of ethnological interest that can be manipulated uh, and, uh, and should be manipulated and displayed and all of that, right? Um, and, and so th that kind of shifts the treatment of corpses in international heritage law and I categorize those corpses uh, between science and tragedy corpses, right? So for transitional justice purposes, we have the tragedy corpses that have dignity all of a sudden, right? They need to be venerated. Uh, they need to be protected um, versus the science corpses, which can be used by museums in the interest of the pursuance of science because they're only ob objects of ethnological interest. There's also really complicated and fairly obvious um, racial and colonial divide here, right? Uh, tragedy corpses happen to be um, soldiers, uh, most of the, whom are um, white or of Anglo um, descendancy, um, and the, the science corpses tend to be indigenous peoples, right? Um, but that kind of creates a shift in the regime, um, and all of a sudden we have three uh, sets of background norms uh, or sets of norms that operate in relation to those corpses, uh, dignity, property, and heritage. Um, and for the most part, cultural heritage law treats uh, corpses uh, under the regime of either heritage or property, meaning that they can be manipulated. There's nothing inherently uh, good or valuable about them. It's only the ones that are underwater that happen to have some kind of dignity. Um, but of course, the dignity conversation is spilling over, and that's kind of the picture you see on the slide. I don't know if you remember this case, uh, but it's um, a Buddha statue uh, that was lent to a, a Dutch museum by a collector um, on the promise that the museum would do conservation work. And part of the conservation work was, of course, to do an MRI of the statue. And when they did it, they found, uh, uh, well, that the statue was actually um, a, a human person, right? Uh, it was a person that had been entombed, uh, mummified, and then covered in metal, and that was the statue. And then people started coming to the museum to worship um, the statue in the exhibition, uh, which was fascinating and weird. Um, and then when there were calls for the return of this statue uh, back to China in the Tibetan community from where it originated, uh, allegedly, uh, then the collector took it out of the museum um, and the statue has not been seen uh, being seen since. Um, that's a tricky combination of words. Uh, but anyway, we can talk more about that in a minute. But the important point being that um, th 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 there's a underwater heritage creates an opportunity to reinvent uh, what, how, the way we treat corpses but it is a very selective and biased one. Uh, but there's a good relationship between transitional justice and the treatment of corpses that merits uh, exploring. Um, so what international heritage law um, does in relation to transitional justice is open this pathway for pragmatism, as I mentioned, um, which uh, forces us to think beyond individualization and this idea that transitional justice is about the human rights of individuals and victims and perpetrators. Uh, no, we can actually think much more 
systematically and broadly about what transitional justice actually means in practice um, and through the law, right? So all of a sudden we have a legal mechanism because it's not focused just on justice and accountability. Um, it's a legal mechanism that forces the contextual thinking uh, about the causes and the consequences of massive human rights violations. So we're, we're allowed to move past justice and accountability as the only valid TJ mechanisms from a legal perspective. Um, and we're allowed to recover at least a version of the political uh, through these contested narratives. Of course, as I mentioned, the conservation paradigm has a penchant for not allowing much contestation of narratives, uh, but then transitional justice kind of kicks in and says, no, actually these narratives are deeply contested, right? Um, so the, the, again, it, it's that, interaction, right, that, that creates the spark, the messy spark of uh, pragmatism. Um, and, um, and, and, and also this interaction allows us, allows us to understand that heritage is a national creation through atrocity, right? It, it's, it, it's about narrating a nation, it's about narrating an identity for the future. Um, however, despite all these potentials, we, we still need to bear in mind that um, we're still talking about fairly state-centric kind of conversations, uh, which tend to be focused on victimhood narratives, sometimes even triumphalism. Um, and the, diplom the diplomacy of pain tends to then replace the diplomacy of shame, right? So instead of shaming bad states for doing bad things to good people or to just people, they can be bad people. Um, bad people still have human rights. Um, instead of looking at that, which is a more proactive kind of thing, it becomes a diplomacy of pain and diplomacy of look how bad, how poorly I was treated. Um, and that kind of creates a bit of a, a shield and a, an insulation for those states. Um, and, uh, but, and there's also a tendency to reenact conflicts via its remnants, right? Uh, which is a dispute between Japan and South Korea and China uh, that we, we discussed briefly. Um, and of course, as with everything, other political agendas in international law, right, uh, can be cloaked in the sympathy uh, or by the sympathy over the victims. Um, I totally lost track of time, so I don't know how poorly I did, but thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, that was fascinating. And I think uh, what was, I think what I really appreciated at probably our uh, attendees too is the, the sheer relevance and po contemporary political significance of what you're talking about, right? That your, your research is uh, also playing out literally in the streets of Sydney uh, in, in regards of statutes and their role and what role law plays. But I'm not the expert, Professor Laura Jane Smith is, and I'm going to give her the floor for some comments and questions. Okay, thank you. And, and I, I need to, to, to state that I'm responding both to, to, the, to the presentation today and to, to the book, because I was lucky enough to, to read a, um, uh, a, a copy, even though it hasn't been, been published yet. Um, and both, and, and what the book, book does is, as, as well as, as this presentation is, is provides a very detailed and, and nuanced accounts of the, the convergence between, as, as, as Lucas has been saying, uh, transitional justice and, and cultural heritage, and, and more particularly cultural heritage law. So for, for, for those of us coming from heritage in the audience, there's an important distinction here being drawn here between cultural heritage law and what cultural heritage does on the ground outside of those, those contexts. But Lucas, as you note, transitional justice and heritage both share a goal of in engaging with the past in the present to help make sense of and navigate contemporary social and political problems and bring new aspirations for the future. And, and the heritage, despite the, the dominance of, of what you've identified as the conservation paradigm, is fundamentally about the negotiation of social change. Of course, unfortunately, the conservation ethic that underpins the authorised discourse and the practices that that frame compels us to arrest the meaning and value of heritage objects and, pl and, and places to not only uh, a specific time, but also a specific set of social values often, often predicated on the assumptions of authorised experts. And as you know, you know, transitional justice has the potential to propel heritage beyond, or at least heritage law beyond that stultifying process. Um, and you, of course, um, this, this stultifying um, conceptualization of heritage is something that, that you challenge in, in, in your work. Um, 
and is challenged by the detail analysis that you provide of how heritage can facilitate and hinder um, transitional justice and vice versa. And as you point out, transitional justice and legal conceptualizations of heritage trip themselves up in ways that can stultify social justice, social justice aims. And, and, um, and as you state, and I quote, um, both transitional justice and heritage law, law sur have surrendered to managerial, expert-driven and anti-political and, and state-centric impulses. And this tends to result in failures as, as illustrated by your examples, such as the atrocity museums that effectively reinforce uh, consensus national narratives that fail to engage with social justice de debates despite their aims to do so. Or at least they produce very narrow and, and, and self-serving or state-serving um, constructions in their, in their narratives. So heritage may be about the identification of focal points for new narratives, certainly. The assumptions being in a, in a transnational justice uh, framework that, that that will get us to somewhere positive, but that is, as you illustrate, not necessary, not ne of necessity the case, especially as the conservation paradigm can work to essentialize or rarefy the categories of victims and, and um, perpetrators. So the universalizing tendencies of heritage law and of heritage practices, and, and what you've called in previous works, uh, the, the orthodox readings of heritage law by heritage professionals is, is problematic. It works to obscure how individuals and communities may engage with heritage and its, and its meaning for the present outside of the frameworks defined by, by law and professional practice. And this works, as you argue, to leave nuance behind, to, to generalise or universalise and to forget or actively reject as, as unimportant localised engagement with heritage and identity claims. So what I found particularly revealing and useful in your work is the breaking down of how transitional justice and heritage law and, and, and how they inter, interact. And at any point in the analysis and observations you make about your numerous case studies, you reveal that there can be both positive and negative outcomes in, in their interactions. And you point out that justice is only possible when we address the specific contexts of situations and to, and to do that requires us to engage with communities and interest groups. Um, and indeed to understand their experiences and um, their understandings and definitions and, and engagement with what constitutes heritage, identity and, and justice. So here I found your arguments about pragmatism particularly co compelling. I found chapter six to be um, particularly compelling in, in your book. And as you know, um, pragmatic thinking requires us to um, not only to reject the, the, the neutrality of law and expertise, but comprehend what the law does on the ground, the cultural and political work, if you like, that it does to, to address it pragmatically. So I'm going, this is one of the issues that I want to raise with you then, is, is what are the implications, and, and the audience has to forgive me, I'm, I'm a cultural heritage scholar, so the, 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 what I want to draw, it out, draw out here is of, of relevance to, to the work that I'm, I'm engaged in at the moment. So as you know, the, the, the um, critical heritage studies movement and the new museology has set as part of its, its aims um, the facilitation of, of, of social justice and, and more democratic and inclusive ways of, of engaging, engaging with, with heritage. But I feel that we are in those movements losing our commitment to engaging with social justice issues. Um, and the experiences of subnational communities and interest groups. And we're doing so collectively as there is a, an increasing engagement with the post, post humanist and new materialist positions and a return to a privileging of material objects in very much the same ways that heritage law tends to reify uh, those, those objects. And of course, people um, lived experiences and their political experiences get, tends to get ignored. So, um, you know, what I, what I guess I'm asking, asking you is, is, is what, what, how can you see tra um, transitional justice and your pragmatic approach help, how can it help critical heritage studies get out of the theoretical cul-de-sac we've, we've gone down 
we've driven down to as in our pursuit of, of, of new materialism and post-humanism. And the other question that I that I that struck me as I as I read listened to you today again and and, and read your book, um, and that admittedly speaks to my own interests at the moment is the role of emotion here. The the conservation par paradigm and that the authorized discourse stress that the um, that the neutrality of expertise um, and and in doing so they 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 arrest and um, or. or uh, allow us to ignore emotion. So the development of the 2018 Underwater Heritage Act in Australia and the various treatment of human remains that you discuss is predicated on certain emotional commitments. The development of the legislation, for instance, is informed by an emotional commitment to narratives of sacrifice and Australian nationalism and so on, which in turn generate their own emotional repertories that, that are then reauthorised by the existence of the law. Choosing to treat human remains as objects of dig dignity or as scientific data are both judgments framed by um, emotional states as much as they are by the disciplines uh, and the law that, that claims and defines those remains. So my second question is, how does considering emotion as an analytical category help disentangle or elucidate the practices and framing of heritage law and transitional justice, if it does? So they're my two questions to you. Lucas, he's you're muted. So, yes. Yes. Sorry, I was furiously typing the questions. And um, okay, um, thank you, Laura Jane, um, and thank you for asking really hard questions. Um, okay, let, let, let me have a stab at the first one. Um, which is, you know, how, as I heard it, how can we see uh, traditional justice and pragmatism help critical heritage studies mm -hmm. get out of this theoretical cul-de-sac? Um, <coughs> sorry. I, I think, yeah, the, those little pragmatist sparks, right, that come out of it. Uh, first of all, they, they invoke a, a, a different and possibly competing theoretical toolbox right or, or thread or um which is that of pragmatism a, a, as like a serious philosophical movement kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, but but i think also uh, on a more fundamental level is to kind of show the limits of those commitments right uh because we can revert back to objects uh, as you mentioned right and we can revert back to this focus on the thing of heritage um as much as we want but at the end of the day when when we see a government ordering the removal of a monument or the creation of a new museum or people just taking to the streets right and, and pouring um tomato sauce uh onto statues and and, and that sounds a bit ridiculous but actually th th there's some there's some chemistry here uh tomato sauce actually corrodes statues in a way that nothing else really does and it's kind of impossible to stop the process once it gets going Anyway, um, just a tip for the future, um, ask, uh, telling for a friend. Um, anyway, um, so I, I think, yeah, what, the, what this encounter, what with TJ and what pragmatism does is to kind of show the limit of the, that commitment, right? Uh, because, yeah, we can focus on the object all we want, but, but when people are not on the ground, when, when people are just rejecting it, it, it can't be that everyone is wrong uh and, and we're not right uh so i, I think it's it's just that yeah it, 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 it's that shake i suppose or that wake up call um I mean, sorry I, I think certainly that that you know reading reading your book and, and again you know thinking about the statues that you talked about at the start it it, it re-engendered my frustrations with where critical heritage studies mm -hmm. is going and i think i think what you're offering here in 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 um your analysis of, of, of transitional justice and heritage is, is a really, really important um, wake up call to where we, you know, the failures, the failures of, of, of critical heritage studies and new muse new museology, um, you know, certainly with the, the, you know, the debates over the statues that we're, we're seeing at the moment, the idea that, you know, that the ob these objects somehow have an agency that's beyond 
a human connection becomes just so much of much more of a nonsense. So, you know, I, I found your book and your discussion really important in that respect. Oh, thank you. And then to your second question, which is even trickier to me anyway, um, which is, you know, how, how does considering emotion as an analytical category help us elucidate the framing of framings of TJ and heritage law? A, a big, so, okay, so this is my admission of stupidity here, because th th there is a growing body of literature on the role of emotions in law and legal reasoning. Um, and there is your own work on emotions and heritage. Um, and, and, and I've been ignoring both uh, for a while now, uh, just because I'm doing other things, right? <laughs> um, so it's not out of spite or anything, don't worry. <laughs> um, so the, but yeah, but so, so there is a growing body of scholarship that tries to get, uh, to figure out the role of emotions in legal reasoning, right? Uh, but it's still very much kind of a running against the grain uh, kind of thing, because there is this assumption that um, law and consequently legalistic enterprise like transitional justice um, need to be neutral and divorced from emotions and, and, and they respond to a, a greater uh, good kind of thing that somehow has been abstracted void of any kind of emotional response. All right, so that's kind of the mainstream narrative and, and the literature and emotions and your own work kind of cuts against that. Um, and, and I think transitional justice, re, it, it, it kind of challenges this idea that anything can actually be devoid of emotion, right? And, and looking at, and I can understand tactically, tactically and strategically why we make this push to be unemotional, right, or detached from it, which I suppose in, in, in the book and in my own work, I, I frame it as apolitical instead, right? Um, but, but, but the work is similar, um, or I think it is similar anyway, um, which is in a transitional situation, you, you wanna make a call to be apolitical um, because you're, you're trying to insulate yourself from a deeply contested and ever shifting thing at the very moment of transition, right? Uh, th th there's a lot of people fighting for a seat at the table, um, including people who just want to perpetuate the old regime, right? So just in new clothes um, and, and people who wanna change a little, people who wanna change a lot, uh, people who just wanna burn down the, the circus, right? Um, and people fight these battles at those initial moments of transition. It's usually why we had a civil war to begin with, right? Or why the dictatorship ends or whatever. Uh, but then he, people need to make a choice at, at one point. Okay, I need to, I've heard you, but now let me go in this corner and I'm gonna do something that is for the greater good, which kind of insulates myself from let, revisiting those decisions all the time, right? So I think it's a very conscious and well-meaning tactical move, but as we all know, it's also fallacious and impossible, right? Um, because it doesn't mean you're ever gonna be neutral, it just means you chose the one type of politics and you're gonna run with it. Um, so that, I think there's a moment for letting people have a go at whatever politics they have chosen uh, and actually try to accomplish something, but, but I think, not long after that, that we need to reopen the, the political and, and emotional and affective kind of space. Um, and we tend not to do that, right? So I think that's, that, that's uh, the contribution of thinking um, of in the heritage space of the, the long lasting kind of impact of making something heritage forever, right? It, it is to show that those um, sentiments, they, they never really go away, right? Um, and, uh, and they will still be there for a long, long time and we need to reopen the, the conversation. So one of the curious things that I didn't mention about sodium in prison is that there are all these um, exit interviews that were done by a group of researchers, um, which showed that anti-Japanese sentiment actually grew uh, in the visitors as a result of uh, being in the sodium in prison. So if anything, the, not only is the place not doing a very good job 
of transition because it's only narrating one part of it, it's actually been kind of productive, right? Because uh, they, they actually, instead of creating a, a bridge for conversation, they're actually creating more enmity at the end of it. Um, uh, and, and that's triggering a very specific emotional response, which law tends to ignore, especially in, the, in, in relation to heritage, because again, because of those, the orthodox engagements anyway, right? We tend to think of heritage as something that is decided outside of the law. Um, but yeah, but so anyway, I'm, I'm starting to go around in circles. Uh, but that's all to say that, that there's a lot to be said about the role of emotions in reopening conversations that heritage law and transitional justice tend to deem as closed. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was fantastic. And I think it speaks to Laura Jane's uh, depth of insight, uh, how challenging questions uh, were for Lucas. And I think for everyone working on the space, in a sense, much broader in the space of international law and transitional justice, right? I think these are questions, um, in a sense, for all of us. Um, I, I have not received any questions yet, so I will abuse my... Uh, I have chair. something from Anna. So she's saying, oh no, no, sorry, she's just saying, yeah. And Douglas Guilfoyle are thanking you and they're saying how excited they are for the book, but they had to go. Um, so I think I'll give people a few more minutes um, for, uh, to, to see if there's any questions for the audience. My question actually follows up from, um, from your discussion. And I was thinking like, if it is entirely um, accurate to say that law and especially law pertaining to transitional justice, um, you know, kind of tries to put emotion on one side, because on the other hand, I think there are very strategic uses of emotion, but perhaps of emotions of particular people. And I'm thinking, for example, you know, if you say anything bad in international, about international criminal law, you're accused oh of, you know, wanting or condoning genocide and wanting little kids to be slaughtered or whatever. <laughs> Uh, yeah. so in a sense, this, this can be a very and, and I was thinking how this person tracks on the cultural heritage emotions because on the one hand if you want um, Captain Cook removed you're angry and emotional but if you freak out about Captain Cook being removed somehow this is an emotion that is not even an emotion right it's so hegemonic that it's just the sun in the sky um, so I don't know if there's exactly a question at the end of this, but yeah, I was wondering if you have thoughts more about the strategic usage of emotion yeah. in transitional justice and cultural heritage and whether, for example, how this ties to what you were talking about in a sense of pro-conservationist bias. Right. Yeah, so that's kind of the thing. Um... And, and yeah, I, I think I, I, I misspoke earlier because I, I definitely didn't want to lend the impression that law doesn't, especially in transitional justice, and relate ha, has no place for emotions. That we pretended that there isn't, right? Um, it, it, there's an assumption that um, emotions played a role before we decided what the framework was going to be, but after we made a decision, then we're, we're totally analytical somehow. Right, and, um, and yeah, it's the people who try to challenge that status quo um, that are, yeah, hysterical and emotional and, and, and do not deserve a hearing. Um, but then of course, yeah, the response is even more emotional somehow, uh, but that's okay because they're defending status quo, right? Uh, or that's the, the, the lie we tell ourselves. Um, so yeah, I, I think, yes, yeah, so, which is all to say, I totally agree that, that there's a lot of role for emotions here. It's just that we, we tend to pretend in the Mac, so the authorizing forces, right, of heritage and transition and, and law being a big one there, um, tends to write off emotion or discard emotion, I think, in, in, in ways that get the work done if you are on the inside, but uh, push away everyone who's on the outside trying to get in or trying to dismantle that um beautifully crafted uh technical enterprise yeah fantastic and uh stephen young is also also has to leave but he's congratulating you for your book oh. and i think i'm 
I'm speaking for everyone when I say I'm truly looking forward uh, to the book coming out. 8th of April, you said. Yes. To be the magic date. Uh, thank you so very much, both of you. I think this was an extremely rich uh, conversation with resonances, uh, of course, the, for those who are working on cultural studies and cultural heritage studies, but I think much more um, broadly uh, for international lawyers. Thank you, Professor Smith. Thank you, Professor Lisinski. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, and before we all hang up, uh, let me remind you that our next seminar is on the 16th of April um, between Dr. Kang Lezang and Dr. Uh, William Bateman, who will be discussing um, international finance law uh, and the politics of that. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for your time and your generosity, both of you. This was a really inspiring discussion. Thank you for organizing and thank you everyone for being here and Laura Jane as ever thank for uh, engaging with my work. Have a nice weekend.